Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Spivey. I am the supervising attorney for the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic at the Justice and Diversity Center. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the changes that you might see on your 2018 tax return. As you may know, the, some laws changed as of December 15th, 2017, so we're just going to do a brief overview. Uh, the presentation will be probably about 45 minutes to an hour, but I will be around afterwards if you have any questions. So uh, what is a low-income taxpayer clinic? We are a national program that's funded by the National Taxpayer Advocates Office. We provide free representation to low-income taxpayers before the IRS in various matters such as audits, appeals, tax litigation, helping people with back taxes. We receive funds from the government, but we're completely independent of and not associated with the federal government. Each clinic, we determine if prospective clients meet the income guidelines and other criteria. So the purpose of the low-income taxpayer clinics is to ensure the fairness and integrity of the tax system by educating taxpayers about their rights and responsibilities, such as this presentation today, providing free representation to taxpayers in tax disputes with the IRS and the tax court, and identifying and advocating for issues that impact low-income taxpayers. Change, big changes are coming. So like I said, the new tax reform was called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and it became effect into December 2017, but most of the provisions will affect your 2018 tax return. There, it affects many parts of your tax return, including what's taxable income, the tax rates, deductions and credits, other taxes, and a lot more. We're going to focus on income, personal income taxes this time, but if you do have a corporation or some sort of business, I highly recommend seeing a tax preparer because there was, there's a whole list of other changes that happen for business taxes. So the first thing is that the new Form 1040 is much shorter. It's actually about the size of a postcard, so about half the size of a sheet of paper. And it's two sides. <clears throat> you can see here, this is a draft of the form. The IRS has to change well over 1,000 forms to be for the 2018 tax season. So this is just a draft. It could The final version could change. But there's a few changes that you'll notice. First, a, again, it's a smaller form. And this font is, is small. So this could affect, affect people who are visually impaired. The signature block is also on the first page of the form, whereas in other years, it's on the second page or on the back of the form. And this is important because if you use a tax preparer, make sure that you turn that form over to review all of the income information before you sign it. Because even if you don't completely review all of the tax information and income and credits, you would still be liable for any, any items that are on that tax return once you sign it. So all of the income and expenses are on the second page. The first page is really only your information, any dependents, and the signature block, and the tax preparer information. There's also less references to various schedule names and numbers that may be needed. So on the old form, for example, the child tax credit, it would say C form 8812 to, if you qualify for the additional tax credit. Well, that, that is not, no longer on there. So it's a little less intuitive. So you'll want to pay attention to the instructions on the forms and not just the form itself. There's also lots of common income types that were actually moved to another form. The law created six new schedules. So while the main form might be smaller, you're going to have a lot more attachments the more complicated your tax return is. So for example, one common one is people who have Schedule C income. So if you drive for Lyft or Uber, uh, or any sort of the gig economy, or you have your own small business, this isn't going to be on the Form 1040 anymore. It's going to be on a new schedule called Schedule 1. So make sure that if you do have any other type of income besides just wages, you make sure that you're reporting that, even if it's not on the new form. So the tax rates also change. You can see I have a chart here, the 2017 year and then the year 2018 to 2025. Uh, so some of these changes that were enacted are 
temporary. They are only for the years 2018 and 2025. You know, they could be extended past there. We don't know. I'm just going to talk about all of them like they're permanent because, you know, that's seven years down the road. We don't know what's going to happen between now and then. So you can see the tax brackets actually went down the tax rates, except for this first category here. They've all been reduced. So in 2017, the top tax bracket was 39.6%, and now it's only 37%. One thing that also changed is the range of income where the tax bracket uh, applies to. The, the, the uh, changes are not that big of a difference, except for in this category here where you're into the 200,000 to 500,000. It's a lot more people that get the lower tax rate in the higher brackets than before. So the first thing that changed on the form is they did make some changes to what is actually income and certain what they call above the line deductions. So the first thing is alimony. If you this is deduction is eliminated to the person who pays alimony, but it's also not included as income if you receive alimony. Um, <clears throat> Also, there previously was a tuition and fees deduction. You could deduct up to $4,000 from your income for qualified tuition and fees that you paid. You, you no longer have that option. Now, there are still some education credits, such as the American Opportunity Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit, but these aren't a dollar for dollar deduction. There's a complicated calculation on the form. And also the maximum is only $2,500 for the American Opportunity Credit, and then it's $2,000 for the Lifetime Learning Credit. The other thing that happened was the moving expenses deduction was eliminated. If you were an employee and say you got transferred from California to the New York office, but they're not going to reimburse your moving expenses, you pay out of pocket for travel, um, U-Haul expenses. Previously, you could deduct that from your from your adjusted gross income, but that has actually been eliminated now. I'm very sorry. I, uh, it's my fault. I wasn't paying attention as well as I should have. But when it had to do, when you had to, you were speaking of uh, the percentiles like 24, 25. The slide right. This one, the tax rates. rates. Yes. Yeah, so the tax rate, so for example, if you made between around $9,500 to $39,000, it went from 15% down to 12%. So that's the highest rate that you'll pay. So for, for example, if you made $100,000, you're going to pay 10% on the income between this bracket, 15 or 12% on the income between here, 22% here, and then the leftover, you would is 24%. So this is the highest rate that you're going to pay. It's not what your overall tax is going to be. Uh, so the other big thing that changed was with the standard deduction and the personal deduction. So previously, for 2017 and before, we have a standard deduction that you can take if you don't itemize your deductions. You always have the option to itemize. So if you own a home or you pay charitable contributions that is above this 6350 you could actually claim those as itemized deductions and there was also a personal exemption of $4050 per person well the personal exemption's been eliminated but you can see that they increased the standard deduction so this has a couple of effects one is the threshold for itemize itemizing your deduction is now higher but if you just took the standard deduction in prior years, you may actually see a benefit here. So if you were single and used a standard deduction, and you, now you get to use the $12,000 as a standard deduction, you get to deduct $1,600 more from your taxable income. So your taxable income will be less than it was in prior years. And for if you're married filing jointly, it's $3,200. So this is a slight benefit if you, if you only ever claim the standard deduction. Everyone who previously itemized their deductions is going to see some effect from this tax law. Uh, the changes, again, they could make that standard deduction more beneficial for you because it's a higher threshold for itemized deductions that you have to meet. 
So I'll go through some of these one by one because they are pretty, insignif pretty significant. One is the medical expenses. In prior years, you could deduct the excess of 10% of your adjusted gross income as an itemized deduction. Well, now that's been reduced to 7.5%. So this is a benefit for you. And medical expenses are things such as doctor co-pays, dental work, uh, health insurance premiums that you pay out of pocket. So if you made $100,000 on your tax return and you'd spent $10,000 in medical expenses. In prior years, you would not have any benefit from that because the 10% threshold is $10,000. But now you'll actually be able to deduct $2,500 as an itemized deduction because it's reduced to 7.5%. And you can deduct anything above $7,500 in this, in this example. The state and local taxes, this is a big one for a lot of people in California. Uh, how many people here own homes? Okay, a few of you. So uh, this one is really gonna be important for you, especially if we work in California, we pay a lot of state taxes. Typically, you can deduct all of the state tax that you pay, like that are withheld from your paycheck, plus any property taxes that you pay. Uh, you can just do a dollar for dollar, but starting in 2018, it's going to be capped at $10,000. It's $5,000 if you're married filing separately. So this is a big change if you own a home. Um, it even affects people, even if you don't own a home and you you have a high wage earner and you have a lot of tax state, you pay a lot of state income taxes, this is also going to affect you. <clears throat> and this includes property taxes, vehicle registration fees, some sales tax that you pay. Uh, the also other change is you are no longer allowed to deduct personal casualty and theft losses unless it's a federally declared disaster, which you can check on the IRS website. Uh, so for example, these fires are definitely gonna be a federally declared disaster and you can deduct any losses you incur from the fires, but Say an electrical fire started in your home and you lost your home. Well, that's not a federally declared disaster. In prior years, you could deduct all of your losses, but now you're, you can't deduct it. There's still some losses you can deduct for business losses, but the personal losses have been eliminated. Another one is job expenses and certain uh, itemized miscellaneous deductions, and this would be at the bottom of Schedule A. The big one here is the job expenses. So if you're an employee and you have to pay some job-related expenses out of pocket, for me, I'm an attorney, I have to pay continuing education credits um, that my employer may or may not, if they don't reimburse them, I could previously deduct it on my Schedule A, but now all of that has been eliminated. So you can no longer deduct any employee business expenses. Yes. Yeah, it's a category that was called. Yeah. That means that you can no longer take these job expenses and certain miscellaneous deductions. Yeah. Charitable contributions. Now, this is going to affect, benefit those that are very wealthy, who make a lot of charitable contributions, or those who have a business, a lot of business losses that reduce their adjusted gross income. Previously, you can deduct up to 50% of your adjusted gross income as charitable deductions, on, as itemized deduction, but now it's up to 60%. You can deduct more, but I don't know about you, I, I, I don't deduct, I don't, <laughs> Uh, give charitable con contributions of 50,000 or 50% of my income. Yes. That's the adjusted gross income. So that's your income minus the, some certain allowable expenses before you take the standard deduction. Yes. this coming year, 2018. So your next tax return, all of these changes are gonna be, yes. Yes. Yeah. 
changes. Yeah, I mean, they can always uh, change the laws, but it, yeah, it's based on you know, what Congress enacted. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so you can deduct, right, you, it used to be 50% of your adjusted gross income, so if you made $100,000, you could deduct up to $50,000 of charitable contributions. So that, you're saying that more refers to the increase from 50 to Correct. So now you could deduct $60,000. No, you can no longer deduct like any job related expenses if you're a d on a W-2 employee. Now if you're if you're self-employed, it's different. You can still deduct a lot of these, but if you are an employee and your job does not reimburse you for certain job related expenses, you can no longer deduct them. So the other thing is mortgage interest. Again, if you are a homeowner in San Francisco, <laughs> this could affect you. If you bought your home before December 15th, 2017, if you acquired the mortgage before that date, you can deduct interest up to $1 million of the loan. And for married filing separately, it was $500,000. But now, if you acquired the mortgage after December 15th, 2017, did anybody here acquire a mortgage after that date? Okay. So a couple people did. You can only deduct interest up to $750,000. I mean, this is big for the Bay Area because most of the homes that are selling now are over, well over this value. So you're able to deduct less interest than before. Yes. Yes. A refinance also counts. That's a, that's a new acquisition of a mortgage. And then home equity Interest is no, you can no longer deduct home equity mortgage interest. So home equity mortgage is a mortgage you take out based on your home, using your home as equity, but you use the loan for expenses related to your home, like home improvements, building a, a second wing to your home. It's not for the actual acquisition of your home, but usually for improvements. Now you can no longer take an interest deduction on home equity regardless of when you took out the loan. Yes? So, um, so in some cases, like, if people change their home, they have to pay interest after the mortgage. Well, you can't, the home equity loan is usually something completely separate, and it can't generally be converted to the loan for the home, because it's usually what happens is you bought the home already, but you have some equity, you have maybe $100,000 in equity, in your home, and you can draw on that to make improvements to your home. And now you, you can still take the home equity loan, but you can't deduct the interest. Yes? That's married filing separate, and MFJ is married filing jointly. So there are some, also some changes to deductions and credits for dependents. And again, this the personal exemptions are limited. Previously, if you had three dependents, you can multiply the $4,050 by three, and then that's a, a reduction of your taxable income. Now that has been eliminated, but they have made some changes to the child tax credit. Previously, you could make you could do up to $1,000 per child. Now it's $2,000 per child. And I, I do have some examples where I show the difference from now to then. Um, so you'll be able to see a little bit of this in action and see the actual impact on tax returns. Um, but there's also a portion of the child tax credit that can be refundable. Previously, it was up to $1,000. So if, for example, if you didn't have any, if you filed a tax return, but it ended up you don't owe any income tax, you were low income, you could get a $1,000 refundable credit that's just money to you in your pocket up to $1,000. Well, now it's been increased to $1,400 per child. 
the refundable credit is also, also adjusted for inflation. So it's been $1,000 for years, and now every year as inflation goes up, then it will also change the refundable credit. The phase out also has been increased. In prior years, if you made $75,000 single or $110,000 as married filing jointly, you could, no, you could not take the child tax credit because it's what they call a phase out. You made too much money for this credit. Well, now it's $200,000 if you're single and $400,000 if you're married filing jointly. So there's a, an entire bracket of people with children that are now gonna see a $2,000 benefit <laughs> reduction in their taxes. They probably they won't get the refundable tax credit, but it will reduce the amount of tax they owe by $2,000 per child, up to $400,000 if they're married filing jointly. Another change, uh, and I think this one's unfortunate, is that the qualifying child must have a social security number. In other years, you, could use, you can use an I-10, uh, but now you cannot Qualify for this credit if your chi child has an I-10, they must have a social security number at the time you file the tax return. There, they did create a new category of credit that's $500, up to $500 for other qualifying dependents. So if you're taking care of an elderly parent, you claim them as a, as a dependent, you can get up to $500 as a credit. Um, it, or dependents with I-10s, you can get up to $500 per child. Yes. So an I-10 is for someone who they don't have a social security number. It's called, it's just a taxpayer identification number for people who don't have or are not eligible for a social security number. So a lot of uh, people from other countries who are undocumented, they use an I-10 to file tax returns or if they, they can get an I-10 temporarily while they're waiting for a social security number, but in those cases they can't get the the child tax credit until they have a social security number. Yeah, individual taxpayer identification number. Yes. Yes. So the, it doesn't matter when the home equity loan was taken out, they've eliminated it completely, yeah. So there were a few other changes. Student loans that were discharged due to death or disability are no longer income. Uh, previously, the entire amount that was forgiven was taxable unless you were insolvent. And we see this a lot in the low-income taxpayer clinic, people who became d disabled and not able to return to the workforce, so they received, they got their student loans discharged. But we have to go and make the argument that they were insolvent to actually get it eliminated from their taxable income. Well, now we don't have to do that. It's just automatically excluded from, from taxable income. The other thing that was eliminated was the shared responsibility payment. Now this is the penalty for not having health insurance. Um, in other years, I think it was around $1,800, $1,900 that you must pay if you don't have health insurance. Well, you're no longer penalized now for not having health insurance. Yes, you had a question? Yeah. No, so the, the student loans are very difficult to be discharged and really the only reason that they are discharged are for death, death or disability. So now, and then in prior years, even if they were discharged for that person, you still had to be insolvent. So if you owned a home outright that you, you maybe inherited or you paid off many years ago and now you're disabled, you wouldn't be insolvent because you own a home in the Bay Area worth you know a million dollars now and you don't have any other debts besides a student loan, then you wouldn't be insolvent, so you have to pay taxes on this. So now we don't have to go into that calculation, it's just automatically excluded. But um, yeah, student loans they can really only be discharged for death or disability. Yes? No, it's about what you own. 
Yeah, yeah. It's about the assets you own versus the liabilities. So insolvency is if your liabilities are more than the assets you own and your net worth, then, then you're considered insolvent mm -hmm. for this reason. So again, the sh shared responsibility payment, I want you to be to notice though that this is not the same as the premium tax credit that you receive from Cover California or from some other health marketplace. So this is very confusing and this is confusing to a lot of people. If you receive premium help from Cover California or some other health marketplace, you still have to report that form. It's like a 1095A on your tax return. And if you make more money than you told Covered California at the beginning of the year you were going to make, you might have to pay back some of that premium tax credit. So it's very important when you apply for Covered California that you get your income exactly right, because if you don't and you go over certain thresholds, you have to pay back any advanced premium tax credit you receive from Covered California. So if your income changes in the year, make sure you contact Cover California, let them know the change so they can adjust your premium tax credit so you don't get hit with a big bill. And this is, you know, I, I have clients who they took out a withdrawal from their IRA in, in the middle of the year for medical issues, they lost a job. Well, that took them above the limit 400% of the federal poverty level, so they were completely ineligible for the premium tax credit. And surprise, when you file your tax return, you have to pay back $15,000, $20,000 to cover California because of this. So if your income changes, if you make, if you get any sort of windfall, if you take any money out of your retirement account, make sure that you follow up with Cover California to make sure that you're not getting too much withheld or not getting too much premium tax credit. Yes. This doesn't affect your Medicare or Medi-Cal. It's just for covered California through the marketplace exchange where you're getting help with premiums that you pay. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Maybe talk to me afterwards when we can talk about it, okay? You had a question in the back? So Cover California is through the, from the Affordable Care Act, they created these health care marketplaces. And if you make a, you know, make a certain amount of money or you don't receive insurance from your employer, you can apply through Cover California and you might be eligible for assistance for your premiums. And the other thing in this slide is what's called qualified business deduction, section 199A. If you have any self-employment income, again, this includes any 1099 income, Uber, Lyft, any of those gig economy, you have this new deduction, which is 20% of the self-employment income, which you get to deduct from your taxable income. Uh, and the reason for this is many people don't realize that you owe self-employment taxes, which is 12.5% of any self-employment income that you earn. And this 20% deduction is supposed to alleviate a little bit of the bill at the end of the year for self-employed persons. But this is very, very, very complicated. I would really recommend that you see a tax planner or a tax preparer if you do have any self-employment or pass-through income. This also includes S-corporation income, anything that you report on like Schedule E or Schedule C. Yes. Both. So if you have a small business, you're going to file Schedule 1, which then references Schedule C. So you have an additional schedule now if you do have a small business. Yes. Yeah, Schedule 1 is where they remove some of those items from the tax return that most people don't have. 
they put it on schedule one. And it's just, they sort of, they eliminated the 1040 EZ and the 1040 A, and they were trying to make the new 1040 a substitute for those. And then if you have a more complicated return, you just have to start adding these additional schedules. So if you have a small business, you have to do schedule one and schedule C. Okay, so I do have some examples here. So <laughs> this is a, they're homeowners and they have one dependent. And I have two cases here. One, they, have, they made about $100,000 and here they made $150,000. So you can see some of the change, some of the differences. One is the deductions. The thirty-five thousand dollars that includes property taxes, uh, state and local income tax that they withheld from their paycheck, and mortgage interest. Those are the only three that I put on the Schedule A. But you can see here that it's limited now to thirty thousand dollars, and the reason for that is for the ten thousand dollars state and local tax <laughs> limit. So for the $10,000 case, I put $5,000 of state and local tax plus $10,000 of property taxes. But here you could deduct 15,000, the whole 15,000, but here you can only deduct the maximum of 10,000. Again, the exemptions in the exemptions were 12,150 and now they've been eliminated. Uh, the child tax credit for this person increased from 1000 to 2000 So the change in tax, they have an increase in the tax that they're going to pay or that they, that they are owe to 7.5%. Now, I didn't include the taxes that they prepaid in. This is just what the total bill would be. You probably wouldn't pay out of pocket if you have W-2 withholdings, but I just wanted to show the impact of the total tax that you will owe on your tax return. Yes? So I put $20,000 of mortgage interest. Yeah. The only limit on the mortgage interest is that $750,000 loan. So if your loan is more than $750,000 and you bought it after December 2017, it would you can only take the interest up to that value. The rest of it you can't deduct. But I didn't I didn't go into that here. It's it's, it's a complicated <laughs> calculation. Um, and then so here for the $150,000, you know, their deductions were a little more because they have more state tax withholdings. So that's the only difference here is they, they withhold a little more state taxes from their paycheck. But the deductions are exactly the same because they're both limited to the $10,000 for the property tax and the state and local tax. But the big difference here is like I said, they weren't eligible for child tax credit before because the limit was $110,000. But they get, and this person got a $1,000 extra tax credit, child tax credit, but they get the entire $2,000. So that results in them only having an increase of 1.2% in tax. So the person who likes, the couple who makes less money is going to see a larger increase in their taxes. And that's because of the child tax credit. And then I put down here the tax rate. So the marginal tax rate, which we talked about, was the highest rate. But the effective tax rate is when you just do a straight uh, calculation of the taxable income versus the total tax, you can see that uh, the tax rate is much lower from previous years. OK, this one is a rent renters with one dependent. And I use the same income limits here. Here, they will actually see a big reduction in their tax. And this is because they took the standard deduction previously. And the joint, the, the, the uh, personal the standard deduction has increased here. But again, this child tax credit is a big one. This couple only saw an increase of $1,000 for a child tax credit, and this person saw $2,000 for the child tax credit increase. And here's a single renter, a single person, no dependents, they don't own a home. <clears throat> I used 100,000 and 75,000 here. Uh, 
and you can see the change in tax is less for both of these cases. Not, it's not as big of a difference as the couple who didn't have a home but have dependents, but it's still a reduction in the amount of tax that you pay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So the marginal tax rate is the rate that your highest income tax bracket is gonna get taxed. So like I said, for example, if you made $100,000, 80, it's like 84,000 and below, it's a different rate, but then the difference between the 100,000 and the 84,000 is taxed at 22%. So it's just about the highest tax bracket. Not all of your income is taxed at the highest tax bracket, the lower income is still taxed at the lower tax brackets. But when you take, a, take into account all of the tax brackets, all of your deductions and credits, that's how you get to the effective tax rate. That's the total amount you're gonna end up paying after everything. Yeah. So a summary of the impact. Middle income households with a home may actually see an increase in the tax, and we saw that from the example. They were the only example that I provided where their tax actually increased. And uh, this is due to that state and local tax slash property tax maximum of $10,000. And in the Bay Area, it's not hard to reach that $10,000 just with your state and local income tax. Much less when you own a home, property taxes are over 1% here. So, uh, it, it's very, very easy to reach that $10,000 limit. And those are the people that are going to see the biggest negative impact to their tax return. Yes? Um, is there any significant impact that you are aware of uh, in terms of the California tax return? No, the, the California tax return has, I don't think, has been changed significantly. The major the major changes were with the IRS. Uh, the, the California did, I think they are playing with the idea of making some changes for the property tax and state and local tax, but I don't think any of that has been finalized yet. But I think they're trying to lessen this impact a little bit because we do pay in California a lot of income tax and a lot of property tax. So it's it negatively impacts us compared to someone in Florida who doesn't pay state taxes. They only have a home they're not gonna be as impacted as much as we are in California where we have state tax and a pretty high property taxes. That 10,000, that is confined and specific only to state tax, is that correct? Yes, state and local. State and local, do you, oh, you mean sales tax? Yes, sales tax. Or Right, you can't exceed $10,000, and the most common deductions there are the taxes you have withheld from your paycheck, property taxes, some sales tax, and vehicle registration fees. It has nothing to do with federal. No, it's just the state and local taxes. Was there another question? Yes. <laughs> um, so, if you get over that ten thousand dollars, which would mean twenty two thousand dollars in tax, I mean uh, taxes uh, total, um, that first ten thousand dollars is going to be. Yeah. So, if you paid twenty thousand dollars in combined property taxes and state and local taxes, you're only gonna be able to deduct as itemized deduction $10,000 of it. The rest of it is just gone. You don't see any benefit from that. You paid it, but you get no more benefit from it. So non-homeowners, they could see a decrease in their tax, and we saw that again from the example, and it, it's just that state and local tax, it's really, really impacting us in California. Another thing that's important is even if your tax rate is lower, you know, if, even if you see this reduction in tax, you may owe more tax on your tax return because they may not be withholding enough from your tax, your paycheck every month. And I'm gonna go through that a little bit in a second. But the, just because the tax that you are gonna owe on your tax return 
does not mean that you won't owe at the end of the year because they're not with they may not be withholding enough from your paycheck every month. And then every case is different. Please consult with a tax preparer or planner. These are just general <coughs> examples that I made up. So uh, every every case is going to be different, and everyone has little nuances. Well, what if you can't pay the tax that's due on your tax return? Uh, we'll always file your tax return on time, even if you can't pay it. If you don't, you'll get hit with penalties. You'll get hit with interest. Um, the statute of limitations on collection for taxes does not start until you file your tax return or the IRS files one for you. You have options if you can't afford it. Again, if you get hit with a big tax bill because your taxes increased, you didn't have enough withheld, you can always apply for an installment agreement when you file your tax return. Uh, you can do an offer and compromise if the amount is significant and you can't make monthly payments on it. You can also do something called currently not collectible, which is just a hold on any collection action. But the installment agreement is what I recommend for most people if you just don't have enough right now, but you'll be able to pay it off within, I think five years is the installment agreement limit, but you can always pay, pay it off quicker than that. And wh why do I say always file your tax return on time? Well, one, you get the penalties. But if you don't file your tax return and you have self-employment income, if you don't file it within three years, you don't get credit with Social Security. Uh, so you actually will get less at the end whenever you retire and you get Social Security because you will be missing those credits with the Social Security Administration. So if you have self-employment tax, please file your tax return on time regardless of whether you can pay it. So if you don't pay your taxes, the IRS or the Franchise Tax Board can file a lien against you. They usually do this for $10,000 or more. They can also levy your bank accounts, just go in and take the money out of your bank account. They can garnish your wages. The IRS actually has 10 years to collect taxes you don't pay, and the Franchise Tax Board has 20. So if they take some off the top of your paycheck every month. They can, the IRS or the Franchise Tax Board can issue an order to your employer, say, hey, you need to withhold 10% of their income. I think it's actually 25% of their income and pass it directly to us at the tax agency. They don't get to see that money. And I can provide these by the slides by email for you guys. And if you have a tax lien, it's going to affect your property. You won't be able to sell your property. If you do sell it, the IRS or the franchise tax board is going to take what you owe them right off the top. You won't be able to refinance. It becomes public record and can affect your employment or maybe your uh, credit score. It's also, it also can prevent you from getting public housing. I have a client now who owes to the franchise tax board. She's been on the wait list for public housing for eight years, and she's now in the top 30 of the list. They let her know. But if we don't get that lien removed, by the time they come to her name, she's going to go right back to the end of the list, and she's going to wait another eight, 10 years. So here's some suggestions. Use the IRS paycheck checkup now. Use it now. So make sure that you're having enough withheld from your taxes. So um, let me show you the website really quick. So here, here it is. The, the IRS has put a withholding calculator here. So you can just fill out these forms here. It has a lot of information that you, you can enter. And I'll show you what um, the result is. And the people who should use this, if you're a two-income family, if you have two or more jobs at the same time or only work part of the year, if you claim credits like the child tax credit, you have dependents age 17 or older, you itemized your deductions in 2017, you have a high income or a complex tax return, or if you had either a large refund last year or you had a large bill, I would recommend that you use this paycheck checkup. And here's a little summary. I just did a, a mock paycheck checkup. Um, and here's, it gives you some great information. It, says, it tells you how much they estimate your taxes to be. It has a place for you to enter your dependents, any itemized deductions, um, 
<clears throat> and it says right here, if you don't, it's, it's very clear in the instructions. It says if you do not change your current withholding, you will have, uh, you will owe this much money when you file your tax return. So this is a great tool so that you can start saving now or you can make prepayments to the IRS ahead of time so that you aren't uh, hit with a big bill and aren't able to pay it at the time you file your return. It also tells you, gives you suggestions on how to change your W-4. The W-4 is the form you fill out when you get a job and it tells you, and you fill out, oh, I'm, I'm a, a, I only have one job, I'm single, I don't have any dependents, and it tells you how much they withhold from your taxes. The Form W-4 did change this year, so even if you if your employer hasn't had you fill out a new one, you might want to fill out a new one, especially if this tool gives you instructions and says you need to, it gives you specific instructions. Enter zero on line five of your W-4. So this gives you very clear instructions on how to have enough withheld, but not too much withheld. Yes? I don't know if California has something similar. This is just on the IRS side. But again, the tax brackets and everything aren't changing significantly with California, so you might not see much of a difference with California. Yeah, I'm not sure. I would check the Franchise Tax Board website, and you can you can see on there. You had a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm retired, and I may be missing a lot here, but so I don't get a paycheck, but I get a pension, and I also sort of scramble incomes from various sources. And in the past, it was like one source or two sources. Now it's like four sources. Should you stick? Can you speak to uh, the withholding aspect of that situation in general terms? So. Uh, you're re you say you're retired, you get a pension. The other sources of income, are they, do you get a 1099? Or are you on a W-2? Or are they just cash that you get? 1099. So you're self-employed in that, con in that uh, situation. So you file a Schedule C, you can do something called estimated tax payments. It's a Form 1040-ES. And so it's different if you are self-employed versus if you have a W-2, because if you're a W-2, they withhold a certain percentage of your paycheck every month and send it to the IRS. But if you're self-employed, it's your responsibility four times a year to pay, prepay to the IRS how much you're going to owe, because we're on a what they call pay-as-you-go tax system. So you would fill out the Form 1040-ES instead of doing the paycheck checkup. So this is just for people who get a W-2. But as far as uh, understanding how much you're supposed to withhold, that's what we're talking about. So all we're, uh, that's a sort of a pre-measurement? Yes, yeah, we're, we're talking so about how much you should... Was the account, that's what the accountant was doing originally. Yeah, so the accountant, when he has you do estimated tax payments, he's projecting how much you're going to owe. For your, on your tax return and saying pay this amount in small increments so that you don't get hit with penalties because you underpaid. No, I understand. Is there a way that I can, without making, you know, without scrutinizing him, I don't want to do, I'm not, that's not my point, but how do you know that you're not maximizing money? Do you have to just trust him? Well, you can certainly use the form yourself, the Form 1040. Yes. There's also, not on the IRS website, but some of the tax preparation sites like TurboTax, they'll have a free tax estimator, which you can use as well. But the, I don't, the IRS doesn't have something specifically for self-employed persons, except for the 1040 ES form, which you, you can certainly go through yourself. You're welcome. That's if you are paying a 401 into a 401k. Um, it, it has you enter like if you if you did a cafeteria plan or a 401k plan. That's what that is. I just entered that number in for this example. A retirement account. A 401k is a retirement account. So if you pay, uh, if your employer offers a 401k retirement account, they can deduct some from your check each month that they deposit in there, and you can get a deduction for that on your tax return. Well, however much you pay in. 
up to, I think, $2,500. I'm not sure the exact amount, but there's a maximum amount that you can deduct for, for contributions. Use a tax preparer or tax software. Please don't do this by hand unless you have, I don't know, just wages, a one W-2. Um, why? Well, you see there's so many changes. These tax software that preparers use or that you can use yourself have all of this information incorporated into their software. They're going to make sure that all of the correct schedules are attached, that you don't leave anything off, that you're maximizing your credits. Um, you can file your returns, certain returns for free with the IRS free file. And there's a link here. You can also look for a free tax prep location. Um, I'll talk a little more about that. And then there's another website called taxchanges.us where it has more details, a little more details about the various changes in, some, in the tax law and some things I didn't go over. The tax form? Yeah. Not yet. Eventually, you'll be able to download the tax form. Right now, it's just a draft of the form. So they aren't, probably aren't going to release it until January, the end of January when the tax season starts. Because they are working very hard to get the forms out right now. Yes? Yeah, so if you qualify for the free free filing software, there are income limits. And there if you, if you have a self if you have a schedule C, you're not eligible for certain types of the free filing software, but if you're I think it's under 64 or 65,000 something like that, you can use these. They're great. It says TurboTax is free if you make under a certain amount of money. Um, if they're still doing it, but Tax Act, again, that's another one that's free for you to use. If you make more than the the income limit for the all-encompassing software, the IRS has something called free file, but you have to be a little more sophisticated to use that. It doesn't auto-populate forms. You have to know which forms that you, to add. Um, so it, I think it'll be worth paying for a software this year if you don't qualify for the free software, just because it's, it's just gonna be a minefield of mistakes that you could make. And also, it's a, it's like a postcard size. I mean, is it going to get lost in the mail? Like, if you mail in a return, I mean, there's all questions that's going to be <laughs> answered. And so if you if you make under fifty four thousand dollars, and there's a couple other requirements, but the thre main threshold is fifty four thousand dollars. You can actually visit a volunteer income tax assistance or a VITA site. There's many, many of these sites throughout the Bay Area in San Francisco that they will open towards the end of January. And you can go on the IRS website here to, uh, to find a location that's close to you. There's also something called Tax Counseling for the Elderly. It's a TCE site. And this they offer free tax counseling and preparation for anyone who's over 60. I don't think there's income limits on this one. So um, if you are over 60, I would take advantage of this. They, they offer tax planning, so if they're as soon as they're open, you can definitely give them a call and say, hey, can you go over this with me now? And on that note, I would try not to wait till April 15th, if possible, to file your return, get it prepared. Uh, you can always get it prepared early and then save up money if you are gonna owe. If you if you don't think you'll have enough saved for the taxes you may owe, yes, you have a question. Are they tax counseling? They don't do the no, tax for you. they do prep. They do preparation. Yeah, tax counseling and prep for sixty and over. Any other questions? There, here's uh, our intake line. If you are having some issues with, we don't prepare taxes at the low income taxpayer clinic, but if you do owe back taxes or your return gets selected for audit, you can certainly give us a call um, or send an email here. But I'll stick around for any other questions. Do I have any questions now?